Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll give it a minute or so to get started. Yeah, let's just give it a minute. I'll share my screen in the meantime. You see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, let's just give it a minute. Okay, looks like we're getting um, about the normal attendance today. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit this morning about our US News and World Report status, which as you know, comes out around this time. And uh, good news uh, that I have to share, you, you may know by now that we're, we continue to improve. Um, just to remind you a little bit about what U.S. News and World Report does. Um, they look at about 1,200 hospitals. Um, they need to treat a certain number of patients to be considered. Um, and then they look at structure, process, experience, and outcomes, with outcomes becoming a more important part of this process as time passes. Uh, this year, our total, our total score was 82.7, uh, and we have now ranked number 12. Uh, so 12 out of 1,200 is pretty good, top 1,000th. One, one one uh, if you consider all, all comers. Uh, and also what's nice is that uh, we're beginning to see traction at MSW and Morningside in the high performing uh, subspecialties uh, in the high performance uh, uh, group. So I'm very proud that we've reached this this level now. I wanted to share with you some of what goes into it and where you know where I see this going. This is a view of our rankings over the past number of years. And what you can see is that this is a very long process to change the needle here. Uh, U.S. News and World Report rankings are backward looking rank. Um, and so uh, this here is the year of transition of chair. Um, what you can see is that the result of Cal Post's building the department from a, really an unrankable, unranked department up into the top 20 uh, was a massive major accomplishment. And that set the stage for our gradual rise up to where we are today. Uh, now, obviously, this is not done alone because neurology is perhaps even more important in the ranking than what we do in neurosurgery. Uh, and so we've certainly been helped by the merger, which occurs at this line here with the continuum healthcare system. Why? The merger allowed us to recruit the best and the brightest. Uh, and when we get to the introduction of Jay Mako later, I'll think he exemplifies that pretty nicely. There's no way he would want it to have come here uh, without the merger. The merger gave someone like Jay or Barbara Vickery or other prominent physician scientists a platform in which to exercise leadership over an entire health system rather than a department. And so I think that underlies our continued rise from the 20s up to 12, that's where we are now. Uh, it's a very tight field. Uh, and as you can see, uh, if you look at our total scores here, 
uh, at 82.7, in order for us to get into the top 10, we have to ra raise by five points, more or less. So that's not easily done, um, but it can be done. Uh, we're certainly in very good company on the right side of the screen. We, you know, we're still, we're now ahead of MGH, Brigham, uh, Barnes, UPenn, Emory. So we're, you know, really doing extremely well. And yet, if we want to get into this top 10 here, we've got quite a bit of work to do. Um, there is what amounts to a science to the ranking methodology. I'm not going to go into all of it here, but you can see that each component has its subcomponents. Um, and you can see some of these here. Um, you also see how the issues are changing, um, how they're backward looking uh, over time. And so uh, let me just see if I can move this here. You can see that for our next rankings, it's possible that there'll be an impact of COVID, for example. On the other hand, maybe our reputation will grow. However, even within the ranking scheme, reputation is a lagging indicator of what we did in terms of procedures and mortality. Reputation may be the thing that changes the slowest. Um, and sorry for some of the craziness of these slides, uh, but what this shows, uh, maybe if I get out of uh, presentation mode, I can just get rid of this or move it down a little bit. There we go. Um, what this shows is within MSH, how neurosurgery does. You can see we've got some, you know, pretty high uh, ranking specialties here. If you look where my mouse is now, the green ones are the ones that improved year over year. Um, geriatrics is first in the nation. That's an incredible coup. And cardiac uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery are number six. So these are our two highest performers. Um, diabetes and endocrine are still doing well, although they, they dropped significantly. Uh, and then we're doing you know, quite well, I think. This gets into the methodology here as to uh, what is our historical trend? Um, what does our local competition look like? So in Manhattan, we're number three. I've, I've often said that NYP is a little bit strange because that's Columbia and Cornell ranked together as if they're one program but we know that they're actually competing programs. Um, I think actually our main competition is NYU, which is really doing very well. And then you can see that the others are trailing. Um, you can see some of the um, total score trends that we, I discussed before. Uh, look at how much we jumped this year though, from 75 to 82. So this is a really big jump. Uh, if we continue that trend, obviously we're gonna be going in the right direction. Uh, the reputation score is determined by doximity and this is why you're gonna see me and Jillian and Alyssa and our, mem our team members going after everyone here to do your voting and really pay attention to this. It, it makes a difference, absolutely makes a difference. Um, this represents reputation trend. And strangely, uh, our reputation decreased this year from 2.7 to 2.5. We've been hovering for the past five to 10 years around this level here. Uh, and I think that as time passes, that can only go up, particularly as neurology continues its recruitment of fantastic new individuals, as, as do we. Um, this is a relative reputation uh, showing that it's relatively stable over time and very hard to change. This shows some of the details that I'm not gonna get into here. This goes into survival mortality uh, uh, methodology. Nareet Weiss uh, is 
pretty familiar with this. Um, there are risk adjustment factors. A lot of this is related to how we document our comorbidities. And so the higher, better our documentation, the longer the length of stay and the, long, and the higher the, the expected mortalities, uh, which give you a risk adjusted factor. So I do continue to remind people that documentation is important. Um, and then they do, you know, exclude transfers, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, uh, this is, you know, pretty, pretty important here. Uh, we're actually doing quite well now with a public survival score of, of uh, five. There are others that did better, like Rush, for example, uh, really, really beat us on this. And then here's the relative rank. Um, there are other things here, other, uh, other contributors to mortality. Uh, discharge to home is another one. Here we're a little worried about the impact of COVID. Um, and here you can see where, uh, where, where we did. So I'm gonna stop there on our US News and World Report, really to thank everyone for continued hard work. It's great to see some success in this. It really is important for driving our reputation and for really representing what we're doing and the good things that we're doing. Uh, so with that, I will turn to an introduction to Jay. Uh, Chris, is he next up or he's gonna go after? Or you we're want me to- Jay's later? questions and then some spine teaching and then Jay's gonna go at eight o'clock. So why don't, why don't I get back with this at eight then? Okay. <clears throat> then I'll take over screen sharing. Okay. Are you able to see my presentation? Yeah. So we've got until 7.20, so seven minutes, and uh, we're gonna do some answers and questions, but I'm also gonna make a plea to um, the attendings and faculty to uh, respond to Angie's email from July 20th. Um, and for that, uh, she needs an updated copy of your CV and a completed faculty scholarly activity template. And this is for the ACGME annual report to the RRC. So this is very important uh, to have in two days. And this is what the template looks like. It's in the email from July 20th from Angie. Let's do some SANS questions. I see I've got most of the residents here. Sorry if I missed you. Um, so we're gonna talk about when you're presenting a patient with an aneurysm to an attending, the, the primary details you need to communicate. So we're gonna ask you to communicate location, the size of the aneurysm described as small, large, or giant. Small being one centimeter or less, large being 11 millimeters to 2.5 centimeters, and then giant being greater than 2.5 centimeters. Whether it's wide-necked or not wide-necked, and whether it's normal or abnormal morphology. <clears throat> and then for a bonus, commenting on the rupture risk. So we're gonna go through those for a few aneurysms. When we're talking about rupture risk, when I'm in the office, these are the data sources I use to give patients data-driven decisions on what their rupture risk is. These are the ISHUA, UCAS, and phase studies. We're gonna focus on ISHUA since uh, Dr. Mako is gonna be talking about um, aneurysm data later. And uh, if you talk to him about what you need to know about aneurysm rupture risk, this is the chart you need to know. So we're gonna go through this a little bit. Um, this is from the ISHUA study. That's the International Study for Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms. And in this study, aneurysms were broken down as cavernous anterior circulation or posterior circulation. And then groups one and two were whether or not the patient has not had a prior subarachnoid hemorrhage um, from an aneurysm, and that's group one. And group two here is if they have had a prior subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in this study, in small aneurysms less than seven millimeters, patients who had a prior subarachnoid hemorrhage were seen to have a higher rupture risk um, in those second two rows there. So that's important to take into consideration. <clears throat> Sometimes you could look this up um, and these are two sites, this is a site and there's an app to look it up, but you know, the important thing is just to memorize that, that table right there. So let's start with Halima. Halima. Can you describe this aneurysm? I don't think I can hear you there. Oh, 
Okay. Let's go with Matt Carr. Matt Carr, can you describe this aneurysm? Uh, this aneurysm appears to be a uh, large left um, internal carotid unruptured. Uh, the neck looks, doesn't look like a wide neck to me, and the morphology looks uh, fairly normal. I would, I would say a few things. I think you can be a little more specific about the location. No, maybe you're right. You're right. On this, you can't really tell. So I do like how you said internal carotid artery. In terms of the neck, I would say that it's wide neck. Um, you know, we don't have the measurements here, but this does appear to me to be more than half of the largest measurement. And so that's kind of a general definition of wide neck. So this does look like it's more than half. So I would say this is wide neck. You can't comment from an angiogram whether it's ruptured or not. So I would not say ruptured or not ruptured. And then I would say the morphology is abnormal because of this bleb right here. And that bleb increases the rupture risk of the aneurysm. Um, so here, here you can see in a little bit more detail from a 3D. Um, and then how about try to give this a rupture risk and because the chart was just shown to you. I'm gonna, so you can see the measurement here is, is eight. Well, let's round to eight right there. So where does that put this one? Uh, so that would put this in the 2.6% uh, uh, rupture risk, I believe. I think that one tricky thing here is that this is probably a PCOM aneurysm and it's fair to say that you don't have all the information to say that definitively. Um, but as a PCOM aneurysm, it actually goes in this group here. So in this study, that's kind of a little bit of a trick. The PCOM aneurysms fall into this uh, row here. So you're actually here. So it's a 14.5% five-year rupture risk. This is a five-year rupture risk table. If you want to find out the annual rupture risk, you can divide these numbers by five. Let's move on to Trevor. Trevor, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Okay. Here we go. Can you describe that aneurysm? Yep. That looks like a right MCA. Or I'm sorry, let's see. Uh, sorry, not MCA. One sec. Just, uh, looks like it's a. Our aneurysm coming off of P, likely P, P2, P3. Yeah. Um, I would say it has a morphology that is smooth. Um, a little tough to tell unless I zoom in, maybe possibly wide neck, uh, depending on the orientation that we can look at on the 3D. Yeah. Um, but right now I would say possibly wide neck. Um, and yeah, I would say so smooth P2, P3 junction, okay. wide neck aneurysm. Okay. Um, I think that it is tough to tell here. It does to me the way this comes out look like it could be a fusiform aneurysm. And I show this one to point out that fusiform aneurysms were excluded from Ishua. However, I, that is the best data that we have, and I would still broadly apply that the numbers to this aneurysm with that caveat that, that aneurysm is exactly like this were excluded. Um, but I do like the other ways you described it. So I just wanted to show the difference between P2 and P3. Um, so I would say this is probably a P2 aneurysm. Um, and that P3 is a little further off at the calcarine artery um, bifurcation further along. Um, so P2 aneurysm. And now when we're looking at the rupture risk of an aneurysm, let's say this is six millimeters uh, in the posterior circulation. So that actually would get us this number right here. Okay, 2.5% every five years. And uh, with that, we're going to move on. 
I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and we're going to hear an announcement about the, an update about the ORs. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Susie, if you don't know who I am. Um, I just want to, before we begin, I just want to give you a brief update on the neurosurgery SSI bundle. Uh, we have been doing a very good job on our MRSA pre-screening for the past month or so, nearly 100% compliance with that. Um, our hand hygiene, our prep, they're all standardized right now. And our neurosurgery bundle has been um, active since July 8th, intra-op and pre-op, which will evaluate um, all the things that we mentioned in the bundle. That includes the MRSA swab, the chlorhexidine washes, the intra-op prep, the glove changes at certain time interval and antibiotics and redosing time. Um, there's already a guideline given from infection prevention that gives you the standard antibiotics that should be used um, given certain um, surgery. So hopefully you guys can adhere to that um, guideline. Now we're gonna go through the nitty, nitty gritty stuff and all the numbers that are shown here on the first slide. As many of you know, every department are evaluated on common OR metrics, such as the first case on time start. Excuse me, Susie, and, are, you, yeah. are you sharing your screen? Cause I don't see the slides. Um, I, I see it here on Zoom. Do you not see it? I don't see it, uh, no. Peter. Um, I don't see it yet. No, you don't see can it. you go to the bottom and say share screen? Um, sure. There we go. You see it? Now we see it, yeah. Okay, okay perfect. Chris. Uh, do you want we're, to- We're up at OR, OR metrics now. Okay, perfect. Everybody can see this right now, right? I think so. Okay, perfect. Yep. So like I discussed before, um, our every department in the hospital is evaluated based on the first two metrics, the first case on time start and turnover time. Um, we've been doing uh, pretty well in the last two weeks or hovering around 72%. And the difference between the two numbers are the one in the parentheses and the one in not parentheses is that if patients enter the room within a 10 minute grace period, uh, which is 10 minutes within 10 minutes of the scheduled time, that is considered on time. But if we remove that grace period, we're actually only be, uh, getting into the room on time of 40%. Um, so realistically, if we if the hospital decides to remove that grace period, we actually are not doing that well. Um, and our turnover time, it has always been hovering about 68%. Other metrics being tracked includes case length accuracy, which is how accurate we book our cases. Uh, in terms of case length and pre-incision time. Um, this pre-incision time is separated between patient into anesthesia ready, which is 37 minutes. We can allocate that to anesthesia getting ready, getting the patient ready for surgery and anesthesia ready to procedure start. And that's 40 minutes. That includes time for prepping, foleys, uh, draping, positioning. So total pre-incision time is 77 minutes. These two metrics are not being tracked by the hospital, but they're just a courtesy thing or and the curiosity uh, metrics that we're trying to trend as well. There are, the, even though that there's a lot of numbers on the previous slide, but I just want you to get into a standpoint as a surgeon, which you guys are, um, if you're waiting for your case to start, that means you're waiting basically at two hours, uh, non-operating, sitting in your office, waiting for your case to start. So that's a pretty lengthy time. And I just want to put everything in perspective. Um, as a suggestion, but at the cluster meeting, which I attended, um, turnover was, I was told to audit some of the turnovers that happened on Annabur 8. There are room, cha room cleaning, equipment changes, instrument issues, uh, paperwork, patient transport, but what can we do to help this and minimize the stress of this OR staff setting up the room? Some common questions that I hear, uh, of course, I'm not trying to let them know that I'm observing this, is what, the, what are the patient's medical history, any significant history, anesthesia needs, whether they need to be fiber optically intubated, um, location, neurosurgic ICU, step down, are they monitored there, allergies, latex, penicillin, whether they can get the uh, standardized antibiotics in the OR, isolation, uh, whether they're PUI or MRSA, contact isolation, Clinical status, whether they're intubated in the neurosurgical ICU, can they be stable to be transported while the room is set up for the holding area? 
equipment needs, whether they need brain lab, fusion, pinning, Mayfield, um, implants, especially with VP shunts, what type of implants you want, what type of implants you want in the room, instrument needs, patient positioning, and disposition after surgery. Um, if these questions are answered, I think that um, it will help minimize opening, over opening trays, and it will improve OR um, efficiency and definitely will minimize the stress in the, um, among the staffs. Susie, can I ask you a question? Sure. So I, I, I'm certain that I'm not the only one because I've talked to others about this, but I know that many of us probably book our cases and answer a lot of those questions in the mm -hmm. book. But often I find that I'm being asked all of those questions again, despite mm -hmm. having booked it with clear answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. do you, do you know and so for outpatient? Is it for outpatient or inpatient? Oh, both. both. So I don't know if there's a better way to streamline that communication chain so that that information is clear, because this could all easily be put on a booking sheet. And whether they and then whether they want to take the effort to read it is a different thing. Oh. Unfortunately, not everything can be not everything can fit on the schedule. Um, I see how the schedules are booked based on CPT code, the name of the patient, MRN, and then there is this special equipment or special request on the side. Um, which can tell what equipments are, are needed, um, but some of the some of the questions are not answered, unfortunately, on the booking sheet. Um, like the type of maybe the type of implant, the look whether the patient's intubated, um, that you have to look in, in the chart. Um, isolation or allergies, um, yeah. these are all needed to be looked at on the chart. Yeah. So I'm I will just going to interrupt Susie for a second. I think yeah. so. I think to answer Peter's question, so yes, when you book a case whether you book inpatient or outpatient, um, all these things go in. The, the one thing that we have to continue to solve for us internally is that we're booking on a system, as you guys have seen with Epic, um, and we moved over to an entirely Epic-based booking and, and uh, scheduling system. But during the day, that communication in terms of, particularly I would say the transition from the first to second case still has to be communication. And, and I agree with you, Peter, that you know, we book, I do, we all do, we book all these things. But I think that communication is what Susie's trying to say is what's going to help us facilitate that turnover time um, and, and getting the next case ready. So you're absolutely right that all these things are there. But I think the more we take ownership, the more we communicate all these things, the more that we can help, you know, with the issue of turnover time. And, you know, Susie's role, and, and those of you already who don't know Susie, she's been our She's been amazing. She's been our, uh, I would call her our OR director, Susie, right? I mean, she's uh, been here at Sinai before. She was with ENT and she's now our system director really for our OR for both ENT and neurosurgery. And she's taken on several of these complex metrics uh, and really taken ownership too of our preoperative process. So I think what we're, what we talked about last time is this concept of transparency in terms of every faculty member having a sense of their own metrics and what things they can do to help facilitate the process for themselves. Because I think the frustration that we all feel um, is often a sense of that we can't change any of this. So this whole discussion really is about what things can we do uh, individually as faculty, as surgeons, as residents to help you know, really move this needle. So sorry to interrupt Susie, but that's, I just oh, wanted to give the framework. No, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we're almost at, we're 7.30 right now. I'm just gonna run through this slide quickly. Um, so our goal first case on time start is 100%. Um, and the hospital actually thinks that it's doable for us because our department is the only department that has a later on time start, which is about 15 minutes after most cases in a hospital. So getting 100% start is a doable thing. And um, Turnover time, this is agreed upon by the OR staff of 45 minutes. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to do to improve this from 68 minutes, but I have high confidence that we will get there. Um, improving case length accuracy, I'll be working with Epic to see if we can uh, give all the schedulers um, a approximate time based on CPT codes to book each case and hopefully that will increase the accuracy. And minimizing pre-incision time, just so you know that this will be tracked uh, when there's a delay, such a long lengthy uh, 
delay between anesthesia ready and surgery time. I don't want to minimize that unsafely, but we need to make sure it's within reason. Um, so proposing these below are the few proposals that I'm going to speak with the, um, the OR staff in the cluster meeting right now. Uh, includes marking in patients when patients walk come in the room and out of the room because sometimes awareness is a key factor. They're not aware of the turnover time that the time is ticking and they're still moving towards their own pace and not knowing that it's already been an hour delay. I mean, an hour difference between the patient out of the room to the patient in the room. If there is a delay of over 45 minutes, Karen has been allocated to be in the room during the discussion of the delay reason. And that will be before the before prep time or actually between any time the patient's in the room, intubated and stable and before prep time, but definitely before timeout to discuss this reason. Um, it shouldn't be argumentative. It should just open a suggestion for improvement basically. And that should be the documented delay. All cases that comes in after the first scheduled time and all cases that have a ten turnover time longer than 45 minutes needs to have this documented. So we are all aware and how we can improve our metrics. Thanks so much. I just want to comment that this is long overdue. It's fantastic work. Uh, and the quality of this work keeps getting better. So I really appreciate what you are doing there. There are many, many subtleties to this. But getting back to what Peter said before, uh, one of the main reasons to re reduplicate this, Peter, is not efficiency, safety. Uh, uh, you can stop sharing your screen, Susie, if you are, or Chris, you could stop the share. Um, and I, I want to go back to aviation. So when you file an instrument flight plan to fly in the clouds from point A to point B, every one of the items that is on our surgical checklist is also on that flight plan. Um, but that is a one-way communication. It's not closed loop communication where accidents happen and planes crash is that there's some change or some difference between what was intended and what was understood. And there's no feedback in real time to the person, the pilot. And this is exactly the analogy in the OR. Even if we think we've indicated something, we have to re-indicate it and get feedback from the team at the time that this is important. Uh, you know, you list that you need a Sonopet and you know it was there, but then you don't do it in the timeout and you realize that it wasn't ready. That's a pretty easy one. Um, so I, I, I do encourage this last time out. I, I've taken, I've gone to take it even more seriously as my own time has passed. Uh, so I encourage people to do that, even if you've gone ahead and written as much as you can down. Okay, what's next? Uh, Frank Uke. All, all right. Uh, good morning. I'm Frank. Um, I was the chief resident out at uh, Elmhurst for the last uh, six months or so. I had a really wonderful uh, spine experience out there. Um, you know, at Elmhurst, especially at Elmhurst, you'll see some pathology that you'll often not see um, at, uh, at East or West. And so I thought I'd present some of the spine cases for the juniors that they won't often see at uh, East. So I, I titled this uh, Spinehurst. All right, so our first patient is uh, 52, history of hypertension, very sick lady, uh, CAD with, uh, LA, um, with the LED stent on 2013 on aspiroplavic. She basically presented with severe low back pain to the ED. Her exam was intact, no clonus, no sensory deficits. All right, um, we'll start from the bottom. Uh, George, uh, can you read this CAT scan for us? It's a CT abdomen pelvis that they got in the ED. So we can see a um, sagittal view of the CAT scan. Uh, there looks to be uh, L, L1 um, and uh, T12. Uh, there is a compression fracture of the uh, L1. Can you see the levels for us again? Yeah. L, level? L2. Good. Yeah. Okay. And, and there's, uh, so there seems to be a, a lytic lesion uh, of the vertebral body of L2. Good, extending into the body of L1. What about the epidural space? Uh, 
uh, there seems to be some uh, extension into the epidural uh, space there. Very good. All right, Halima, what's your differential when you see this as a consult in the ED? Uh, Matt, what, what about you? What's your differential? I think my differential uh, would include, uh, you know, neoplasm, so some sort of uh, either benign tumor like an osteoma or a malignant tumor like a metastasis or a uh, primary malignant bone tumor. What else? Um, I think it could possibly be infection. Um, something like osteomyelitis okay. um, or like a hemangio, uh, hemangioma, hemangioblastoma yeah. as well. Okay. And also something to also look at every time you look at uh, sagittal CAT scans, always look at the bladder. She has a very distended bladder. I mean, she didn't really complain of any urinary incontinence, but it's also always important to see. You'll see it on MRs and you'll see it on uh, most CAT scans. So your next steps, Matt? Um, I'd want to get an MRI. Okay. since it does sort of extend posteriorly to the epidural space. So now here's the MRI. Can you read the MRI for us? Yeah, so on the left we have a uh, mid-sagittal view, um, T2, and then a uh, stir, I believe. It's not a stir. Uh, which, Sorry again. Not a stir. Um, the vessels are lighting up. Is that a uh, post-contrast? Um, so we have a contrast enhancing, uh, peripheral enhancing mass and the vertebral bodies of uh, L1, L2 are enhancing. Uh, it's the fecal sac appears to be uh, compressed at that L1, L2 level. Okay, good. Um, and so now what would you offer this patient? I mean, I, I would want us to get tissue, I mean, either through a biopsy or more likely just through resection of that, that mass. Okay. So yeah, so we, we got IR and ID consults and the CT guided biopsy showed mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, and other infectious work was negative, including HIV and any other immunocompromised uh, state. So she was basically, she was placed on ripe therapy for a year. And what's ripe again, um, Matt? Uh, rifampin, isoniazid, uh, Ambitol and pyrazinamide, I think. Nice, very good. So she was put on ripe for a year. So this is likely POTS disease, or this is POTS disease, which is extra pulmonary TB involvement of the spine um, in less than one to two percent of patients with TB. It's most commonly found in the lower thoracic, upper, and the upper uh, lumbar, which is exactly in our patient L12. Uh, named after actually Sir Percival Pott for his description of spinal tuberculosis back in 1779. We often don't see it in in uh, in our in at East, but we do see it sometimes at Elmhurst because of the uh, patient population at Elmhurst. And Pott's paralysis describes uh, paraplegia, uh, rigor, uh, resulting from progressive um, uh, compression and kyphosis. And here are some of the mechanisms, uh, mechanical pressure, tuberculous, tuberculous granuloma, myelitis, spinal artery thrombosis, arachnoiditis. And for our patient here, obviously we have mechanical pressure and, and, a, and a granuloma in the epidural spine. So she was lost to follow up <clears throat> until 2019 when she started seeing a, a pain management doctor at Elmhurst for severe low back pain, progressive kyphosis, and she now started complaining of urinary and bowel incontinence and now walking with a rolling walker. She was referred back to us and her, now her exam, she's weak throughout her bilateral lower extremity with positive clonus. And um, I guess, uh, Abhi, what's your next steps now? Okay, uh, Alex, what's, All your, right. oh, sorry, Abhi, no. what's your next steps? All right, so uh, first step, I would, um, I would need a repeat imaging for the patient. Um, so I would get a repeat CT scan. Um, just to evaluate the spine first. All right, now read, now read the MR for us. So I got to repeat MRI, oh, MR. and this is the MR. All right, so MR mm -hmm. uh, looks uh, significantly different from the first one. You can see severe uh, uh, kyphotic deformity of the uh, L2, L1, almost complete collapse. Uh, um, yeah, very severe kyphotic deformity with the protrusion of uh, uh, disc as well as probably associated bone into the spinal canal causing um, uh, compression of the cord. 
you can see some uh, hyper intense signal changes uh, even within the vertebral bodies. Um, uh, hard to say, hard to see any real cord signal changes. On the T2, it, it looks like there might be some due to the compression, but it's uh, mostly um, deformity as well. Right. So this is what's left of the L1 pedicle here, and this is what's left of the L1 body here. Likely it's fused L1 to L2, and, uh, and here's, uh, here's the other pedicle on the other side. And yes, that this is likely burnt out POTS disease, you know, three years after, after her initial presentation, and she's developed a severe kyphotic deformity. And, uh, and now we got a CT um, standing x-ray in lumbar spine. And what, what can you note here? All right, standing x-ray in lumbar spine. Now, so you can basically, it re re demonstrates what you saw in MR in terms of the deformity. Uh, however, you can see the collapse. Uh, um, hold on. Tell us about the bony quality. And I mean, it's pretty, yeah. Uh, it's pr pretty poor quality. Um, now, especially uh, if you look at L2, um, L1 is almost completely collapsed, but L2 is also looking that it's, uh, uh, it's getting more and more lytic. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, or more and more uh, poor, yeah, weaker, basically. Yeah, and, and you can see that actually on the standing x-ray, the bones are almost translucent, suggesting that mm -hmm. if you were to offer surgery for this lady, that it would require significant amount of screws to try to uh, get good purchase. And you can also mm -hmm. note that the L1 pedicle is likely fused onto the body of L2. And what do you note here anteriorly? Uh, looks like there's some sclerotic changes actually. Um, uh, the vertebral bodies are also fused, I guess. Okay. Uh, looks like T12 and L2. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so what are your next steps now for this patient? Comes all right, the, so- Comes mm -hmm. to the clinic, now she has all this back pain, urinary incontinence, she's weak. What do you wanna do now? Well, I guess she needs uh, some sort of a correction. Uh, you know, just to improve her pain uh, in general. And like you said, due to poor bone quality, she's probably gonna need like a long fusion. Okay, so once you offer surgery, we talk about some of the anticipated issues, mm -hmm. poor bone quality, there's a fusion anteriorly of T12 uh, to L, sorry, L2, sorry about that, L2 circumferentially. And the question is, are the L2 pedicles salvageable? Or can we salvage this body? And so I offered, uh, we offered her <clears throat> a T9 to L5 instrumentation fusion with cement augmentation. We offered her L1 VCR deformity correction. And so I mentioned she was 55. Why not go to pelvis for her? Um, that's a good question. I, I, uh, it, I, I don't know to answer that, to be honest. It's very reasonable to go to pelvis for her. Um, but given her age, we decided to give her one shot um, and then try to correct the deformity without going to pelvis. So we stopped at L5. And uh, Abby, what Schwab grade is a VCR? And what is a VCR? Uh, it's a vertebral column reduction. It's basically what can offer you the most. It's one of the, it's the procedure that offers you the most uh, low doses uh, if you're trying to achieve that uh, right after the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Very good. This is the next step. Okay, let's go over the Schwab grades. What's Schwab grade one? Uh, Schwab grade one is uh, a resection, uh, the uh, removal of the facet, uh, facet joints. Uh, it's a partial facetectomy. Partial, yes. Schwab grade partial. two. It's there. You can complete, just, complete yeah. facetectomy. Also called a Smith, Smith Peterson osteotomy. Smith Peterson. Mm -hmm. And three. That's the PSO. Right. Osteotomy. Mm -hmm. So then what's four? V VCR. No. No. So, oh, it's PSO with the uh, uh, two. Um, with the it's basically three and two combined. Good, yeah. Uh, uh, no, you always do a two when you do a three, but a four uh, includes the disc. Okay. It gives you better correction. And a Schwab grade five is a VCR. And then mm -hmm. Schwab grade six? Uh, Two VCRs. Two VCRs. Multiple levels. Okay, good. So these are all, all, all the intrap imaging. So we did four up, four down. Uh, we place all our fenestrated screws and fenestrated screws have um, uh, holes at the bottom uh, of the screws. And uh, we went four levels down as well. 
And then we inject the cement on the live fluoro. Uh, some things to remember when you're injecting cement uh, using penetrated screws is that you have to select slightly shorter screws. As you can imagine, if you put long screws down here, there's no more space for the cement to purchase. So you have to remember to put slightly smaller screws in. And uh, you also wanna check an AP uh, uh, X-ray before injecting cement. If you have a medial screw, especially in the thoracic spine, you're gonna you're you're likely to inject into the spinal canal. If you have a lateral screw, you may inject into the lungs or the pleura. So you want to have good screws, um, uh, uh, both on an AP and lateral before injecting the cement. So then we also did it. I did a four or five T lift at the uh, lowest level for anti column support, and I also took down the right T eleven and twelve uh, ribs for uh, for for bone graft, which I'll show you later. Things, also things to remember when you're doing uh, rib resections is that you also you always want to have some sort of a 3 bicycle stitch ready, but not on a cutting needle, but on a taper needle, like an SH needle, because um, uh, to repair the uh, pleura if it's torn during the rib resection. And remember, stitching pleura is like stitching tissue paper, so you don't want to put too much tension, and you don't want to use a cutting needle. And you also want to spray Duracell over the suture line prior to closure. And uh, whenever you do these rib resections, you always want to extubate if possible to prevent positive pressure ventilation. If you do have a pneumonia hemothorax, it'll worsen uh, if they're not extubated post-op. And always remember to get a post-op chest x-ray. All right, so then we placed a temporary rod uh, and we did bilateral T12 and L1 uh, and L12 complete pontiosteotomies. And then we did a very long laminectomy. And Abby, why do we do such a long laminectomy? Uh, T202. It's the dermat you're trying to get a, yeah, you're trying to correct uh, into the kyphotic deformity into a lordosis. Right. Because if you, if you do a laminectomy and you pull you pull it back, you don't. Uh, it actually helps you with uh, achieving more lordosis because there's more lamina. Right, and the, the dura will buckle as you pull the dura back and try to do the correction, mm -hmm. and it'll lead to compression above and below the level <clears throat> of interest. So you want to actually do a much larger laminectomy than you originally planned. Um, and then so we removed bilateral L1 pedicles uh, using an osteotome, and we did the transpedicular corpectomy. So then I put the temporary rod on, and I tried to do the correction, but I couldn't get any better correction than this. But and why is that, Avi? What didn't I do yet to complete the VCR? We could bump it up, Trevor. Uh, Ray. So I took down both pedicles, but I still can't correct her that much. And why is that? What didn't I do? Like is, uh, I thought anteriorly there, she was also fused. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. there's an anterior fusion here that it's preventing the correction. And so I had, I, I, I was trying to not do that and see if we can correct her uh, without uh, breaking this, but we couldn't. So then uh, we took an osteotome and we did bilateral transpedicular. Um, uh, we, we went transpedicularly both ways and uh, broke that ALL. Uh, sorry, that, that fused segment and almost to the ALL. And you can see that my Penfield 4 is going through the bodies of uh, 12 and 2. So then once we've done that, uh, why is this a dangerous maneuver, Ray? <laughs> if you plunge, you could hit a lot of stuff. <laughs> exactly. What, what stuff could you, could you hit? <laughs> a word, uh, a word uh, uh, SBC. Good. Uh, a word, uh, yeah, many yeah, things. Exactly. So if you plunge, yeah, it would be very bad for the patient. So then we use these in situ sagittal benders. This is, I just drew this on there. Um, and you use these sagittal benders to pull and, and, uh, and, and compress across the segment to try to get a better correction. You can see that once we've done that, uh, uh, once we've drilled through this, now the spine is mobile and that uh, we're able to correct her. And once we've corrected her, we can put the cage in. And once the cage is inserted and expanded, you can't really do any more um, correction except compression. And why do you need compression, right? Because um, you want the you want your cage to be like under pressure, so it'll fuse. And and what level like, are it, we at? Is there still cord here? Say again. What level are we at? And is there still cord here? Uh, we're at. Or I thought we were at uh, L1. 
Right, so there's still cord here. So the yeah. cord stretch, and during this uh, correction maneuvers, so you actually want to compress her across the segment to try to re reduce any uh, any spinal cord stretch. <clears throat> All right, these are our final chop X-rays. You can see that we got her from this uh, to this, and our final X-rays look very good. And then we place a permanent rod on the contralateral side, and then we fixed everything. Uh, so what did I do with that rib graft, and why did I take that rib graft? Um, during the unit, if you do a unilateral transpedicular corpectomy, you don't need to often do this because the contralateral side still has the pedicle, the transverse process, and oftentimes the, uh, the, inter, uh, the facet diffuse across. But during a VCR, you don't have either pedicles, you don't have any uh, superior inferior articulating processes above and below, and you don't have any of the transverse processes. So how, you can't achieve fusion except for the except for the bony graft that's in between the cages. So <clears throat> we, I took those rib grafts and um, I, and I decorticated the rib grafts and I put them medially along and then and then tied them down along the rods so that there's bony fusion now and there's a bony bridge to uh, to fuse across. And this is our final x-ray. This is our pre-op x-ray. This is our post-op x-ray. Uh, looks very good. And uh, she did very well. She actually regained her strength, the full strength. We were able to uh, trial avoid her on, um, on day three through five, and she passed uh, urinary and bowel function. We started our back on aspirin 81 uh, on day one, given her high risk. And she, we just saw her in clinic five months uh, post-op, and she's now ambulating on her own. So a nice case there. Uh, I think we have time for just one more case quickly. Uh, so this is a 47 year old male with no past medical. He was drunk and he was hit on head on by a vehicle. Um, and Ray, can you read this uh, uh, CAT scan for us? Yeah, so I see that uh, on the sagittal, there's a anterior lithesis of the odontoid on, uh, on, uh, onto the C3. Okay, what else do you see here? Uh, Oh yeah, see the pars fracture of two, All right, C2. Good. Yeah, you see bilateral pars fractures at C2. Mm -hmm. Here's axials, you see the axial here, large fracture here, large uh, fracture line here. This is C3, you can see that she, he also has a split body fracture here, a lateral mass fracture here. Okay, next steps, we'll get, we, got, we couldn't get x-rays because I thought, she, I mean, he was unstable, so I didn't want to stand for x-rays, but we did get a CTA neck to see if there's any vert injury. Uh, it was over the weekend at Elmhurst, so we couldn't get an MRI. Um, and here's CTA neck. You see that he, on this, the right side, he has a very hypoplastic um, uh, uh, right vert, but in a dominant left vert. Here are the axials. Uh, and you can see that luckily for him and for us, for surgical planning, his, uh, his right uh, vert exits before it gets the fracture, which is very, very good. And you can see that uh, the fracture doesn't actually go through the transverse frame on that side. I think my computer froze. Uh, I think my computer froze here. The slides froze. Can you unshare your screen and then reshare your screen? Yeah, I'm trying. <clears throat> Okay, here we go. And this is a hangman's fracture, right? This is what we classify hangman fracture. Uh, we'll just go quickly over them. We have a few minutes. Type one is where you have less than three millimeters of horizontal displacement and uh, no angulation, and the mechanism of injury is axial compression hyperextension. This is a stable fracture, you can just brace it. Type two is what we see here, is greater than three millimeters, and the significant, uh, significant angulation, but less than 11 uh, degrees, and uh, this is an unstable fracture. And the treatment is if it's greater than five, uh, if it's less than five, you can reduce it, if it's greater than five, surgery. Type, type 2A hangman's fracture is a horizontal fracture line with significant angulation greater than 11. This is often unstable as well and requires often surgery, but you want to avoid traction in these patients so you don't basically decapitate them. And then type 3 fracture is one that's associated with a C23 facet dislocation. This is unstable and requires surgery as well. 
So we'll just go quickly over that. I took him to the OR. The options are OC Fusion versus a small segment front back. He's 47, so I wanted to save him the OC Fusion, um, given that OC Fusions are fairly morbid, especially in a 40-something year old. So I did a front back or back front on him instead. And uh, we, can, we can skip all this. We'll just go quickly through the rest of the scans. Uh, and so I placed C1 through four screws. And to do the open reduction, uh, we put a rod across C2 and four, and then we gently cantilevered those screws onto uh, C1. And you can see I pushed down there, and then we flipped the patient for a C2 to four ACDF, and you can see already the fracture line is already well, um, has uh, reapproximated very well. And this is pre and post op uh, CAT scans. You can see that the fracture line is very well approximated here and here. Um, and, you. Um, and you can see that he, he, um, he's reduced very well by doing a nice front back on him. He did very well. He stayed neurologically intact. He went home on post op day three and he passed speech and swallow. Uh, I think I'm out of time. I'll hand it back to Dr. Uh, Dr. Bettison for Dr. Mako's talk. I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, very nice, Frank. Good, so um, Jay, are you uh, on deck? Yes, I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, not that Jay needs too much introduction, uh, but I just wanted to have a chance to, to show you a couple of things that you probably already know. Uh, Jay Mako is professor and senior vice chair, uh, director of programs development, director of the world famous Cerebrovascular Center. Uh, he's transitioning his directorship of the residency program and co-runs the fellowship uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Mount Sinai Health System. Jay got his BS at University of Miami, um, an MD and MS at Columbia. I did his internship and residency also at Columbia and then was a clinical instructor uh, in Buffalo where I know he learned a lot, uh, not just about endovascular methods but also about entrepreneurship and business development uh, which has bloomed into a second part of his whole career. He then moved rapidly through a series of escalating responsibilities first as an assistant professor at University of Florida and then as director of his program, winner of a U grant and a real national force at a very young age uh, uh, in Vanderbilt where he became associate professor uh, in both neurosurgery and radiology. Since coming to Sinai in 2014, he has become a tenured professor and senior vice chair, the only senior vice chair in all of Mount Sinai. Uh, his publication, his, his influence in vascular is widespread. Uh, the publication number grows, but the impact is really what counts. Um, he's really recognized as a clinical trialist uh, and has recently been awarded increasing responsibility in stroke net and other areas that are gonna see him, I don't wanna say dominate, but have a major influence on the way stroke is managed nationally, internationally in the coming years. He's won tons of awards, has been chair of the CV section. Uh, I think that at the moment, his current favorite award, uh, is not really his award, it's the award of, of his residence, which was to get the most abstracts at the CNS. Um, and that sort of says volumes about Jay that his most proud accomplishment is the one where the people around him are succeeding. So uh, I'll stop sharing and Jay, look forward to your comments on your work on aneurysms and the FDA, FDA today. Uh, let me see if I can get out of this here and give, you, uh, give this over to you. Am I still sharing? No. Yeah. Oh, not now. Good. Right. Now I can share, right? Yes. Okay. 
All right, am I sharing? You are. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for the invitation to talk. Uh, pretty excited to participate in this and do this. Let me just uh, adjust this. Um, you know, this is, I, 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 I'm not sure how this is going to go off <laughs> um, with, well, with, uh, without being in the room with you guys and being able to see your faces. Uh, the intent is for this to be a little bit more of a mentorship type talk. Hey, does anyone know how to get rid of the controls for the Zoom? It's like right over the top of my slides. Is there a way to hide or something? We, we don't see them, but you- I know, you, but I do, I, it's annoying me. You can move it over to the side. I don't think you can hide it. Okay, there we go. I think if you go to view options, you can, there's a drop down, and you can hit- I got it out of the way now. Panel. Thanks, sorry guys. Okay, so anyways, so my intent, my intent is for this to be a little conversational and a little bit of a sort of mentorship experience of, uh, uh, of giving a perspective about how a career can work out in ways that you don't necessarily anticipate, but hopefully matter in the end. Um, and there are a couple different, I thought of a couple different ways to do this, but I, I thought this might be the best one. And so this might be the longest title I've ever come up with for a talk, which is a reasoned review of aneurysm treatment assessment and indications, uh, one doctor's contribution to an FDA panel review. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let me get into that. Uh, first, let me show my uh, disclosures. None of these are relevant to this talk at all, uh, so there should be no issue. Sorry, give it a few seconds, make sure everyone looks. All right, good. And uh, another way I could have titled this is, uh, I thought, serendipity, uh, the, the twists and turns of, of an academic career and how you may end up being useful. Uh, when I was thinking of this last night and, and putting it all together, um, I, I it, it brought to memory uh, these, did any of you guys ever read these books? My mom had these, they were like these books made in the 70s that were called the serendipity books. And they were basically like these little soft cover books for little kids that had morals, you know, how important it is to be a friend, how much it is to like yourself or, or whatever else. Um, but man, I remember when I was whatever five or so, really loving these books, uh, and and it's interesting because as I was making the talk, I realized I was trying to create my own little modern neurosurgical serendipity story, um, and and so that's that's kind of the approach I, I'm taking with this. So I'm going to start with the end, which is the FDA. The FDA, when there is a substantial question about how they should do things or how they should evaluate things. They create something called a panel review. They pull together about 20-ish physicians from around the country um, to sit on a panel review. Now, those physicians can have no conflicts whatsoever with any kind of indirect relationship with any kind of industry or anything else. Uh, and, and it ends up being quite a struggle for them to find people because of that. Um, but they did. Uh, some of the people on this panel, this is public knowledge, would be Greg Thompson, Kadir Erkman. Really, I think they were the only two neurosurgeons and then a lot of neurologists, some statisticians and others. And the, the panel was to evaluate key questions regarding brain aneurysms and which aneurysms should or shouldn't be treated and which aneurysms should or shouldn't be eligible to be involved in trials to evaluate the value of new technology. Now, I was not on the panel, but I was chosen um, to be one of three individuals who responded to the pre-specified questions that the FDA does. So the way they do this is it's sort of like a, uh, I, I haven't done a Supreme Court uh, uh, discussion, but it, it's that concept where they provide you what things are, everything's done written before the oral arguments and, and, and that's the way this went. And then everyone showed up in DC and you present your points to them uh, in about a, uh, in a, a particular time frame. And in the end, I, I'm, I'm proud of this effort because it made a difference, I think. Uh, and yet this is something that doesn't end up really on a CV in any way that's meaningful. It doesn't end up on your NIH biosketch. It's not the kind of thing that regularly comes up when you list things you've done in your career. Um, but I hope to highlight that what we really care about is if we're contributing and making a difference and 
not necessarily uh, whether that that comes with particular accolades. Um, so that's the end of the story. Uh, the beginning of the story starts with a lot of things in my life, with a city with a skyline that's nice. It's not quite New York, but Buffalo, New York, you can see right on uh, the lake there. Some people call it the mistake by the lake. I don't call it that. I, I actually really like Buffalo. Uh, it was a wonderful place. Um, and the influence of a particular individual, a guy by the name of Nick Hopkins, um, who's been a tremendous uh, mentor to me. And when I showed up there, they had created a thing called the Toshiba Stroke Research Institute. Uh, and at the time, the medical center was right in the middle of that picture on the, that, that city on the circle, actually a little bit towards the edge of it, uh, deep away from the water. But the university, the medical school, and all of the research capabilities, the Toshiba Stroke Research was a solid 45 minute drive out one of those diagonal roads into the suburbs. Um, and as a result, many of the fellows couldn't really engage or get out there, or, you know, when it was, when they had been on for two days straight and it was an afternoon, uh, wouldn't be able to physically get out there to work with the PhDs. And that was a huge opportunity for me. I was able to get out there and just get amazing um, opportunity to engage with all these smart PhDs. One of the, one of the people there who I worked with on a grant, and we got the grant, was an astro was a uh, I don't know what her real title was, but was a physicist, a, a, a rocket scientist, um, who did flow dynamic work and the rest. And with working with her, uh, we just started to look at predictive factors for aneurysms. And some of you have heard parts of this story before, but Basically, we did an aneurysm morphology study on 3D CTAs, and we did a uh, multivariate logistic regression. Um, and we looked at all these different things, and one of them we invented ourselves, something called size ratio, which was the size of the aneurysm compared to the, the parent vessel diameter. And what we found in this analysis was that size ratio, as well as what's something called the undulation index, which is quite cop uh, complicated to calculate, but it's about the irregularity of the aneurysm. Uh, we're both very predictive of whether an aneurysm was a ruptured status or unruptured status. So think this through, right? So a, a six millimeter aneurysm on a small anterior cerebral artery would have a size ratio of four, but a 10 millimeter aneurysm on a big carotid artery would have a size ratio of two. And, and realistically, if you guys know from experience and all the ruptured aneurysms that come in, we see a lot more ACOMs and we see ICA aneurysms that present rupture. Okay, so this was exciting. It made intuitive sense. So we decided to then do some, you know, use this rocket scientist uh, computation of fluid dynamics, you know, finite element analysis stuff and do some fancy uh, flow dynamic analyses and where we either change the size of the parent vessel relative to a fixed aneurysm or change the size of the aneurysm relative to a fixed parent vessel. And we did it for sidewall and terminal aneurysms. And in all cases, what we saw was what you'll see here is increasing red. We, um, we saw changes in the hemodynamics inside the aneurysm to be more consistent with ruptured aneurysm, hemodynamics that were associated with ruptured aneurysms. And you see these areas of extreme changes in wall shear stress that uh, had previously been demonstrated to be associated with ruptured aneurysm. So it was a confirmatory finding. Um, so we have a retrospective 3D study that shows this. We have hemodynamics that show this. Um, so what else could we do? Well, the next question is, is, would it work prospectively? Did it work on 2D angiography? Would it work if you, we did a blinded analysis? So we did this, I won't belabor it, but it was a prospective blinded analysis of 40 patients. Um, we had 24 unruptured and 16 ruptured patients. Uh, they got it evaluated on their initial presenting angiogram uh, whether they were ruptured or unruptured. And again, the analysis was, was blinded. The basic demographics and risk factors were showed no differences between the groups. Um, but you'll see while size just met significance, it was a very, it was a one millimeter, 1.8 millimeter difference, which is very hard to see. Whereas with size ratio, you had an almost twofold difference, um, which is really well represented in this graph. And that really, uh, sort of confirmed our findings. It got me really excited for basically for every one point you went up in size ratio, your risk of presenting as a ruptured aneurysm doubled. So we showed that this could be done, that it worked really well, but 
we had that classic sentence at the end of a paper, this should be studied in a large perspective, you know, analysis. Um, and so I wrote to the issue of the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms, residents, you've all heard me talk about this, and uh, I sent them a bunch of emails and they never responded. And, you know, this is a little bit about, you know, you do some perseverance, it doesn't work out. I, I, you don't want to push too much in a direction that's not providing value. So I started focusing on other things. And this is where serendipity and, and your mentors step in because that guy, Nick Hopkins, came in the office, came in the angio suite. I was setting up a case of his or about to do a crowded stent or something like that. And he just sort of nonchalantly asked me how things were going, a little small talk, asked me about how that aneurysm stuff I was doing was working. And I said, well, the, the issue of guys really hadn't gotten back to me and, and nothing had happened. And I, I love, I still have this email. This is from May of 2008. Um, and he emailed Dave Peepgrass and said that, why have they been stonewalling us? And what would be going on? I mean, he just went right to, he didn't even say to me he was going to do it. He just went right after it to support his mentee. Uh, immediately, literally, like in, in sh short order, uh, we started getting responses. I apologize for the misunderstanding. I'm sorry if there's a misunderstanding. And and this response led to me getting involved in this International Study of Unruption and Intracranial Aneurysms Writing Group. So here's a series of papers that over the subsequent um, eight years, I've been able to be a, a lead author and, and really dig into this data set. And so being, becoming an expert on this, becoming someone who's published and looked at the, the only major international prospective study of this, you would think this would be why I would end up being the person chosen to present to the FDA. Um, but the short answer is no, that had nothing to do with the reason. That was just a serendipitous background that allowed me uh, the opportunity to have some insight. So then the question becomes, well, how does that work, right? Why do we do some of the things we do in academic medicine and where does it give us the opportunity to do this sort of thing? And again, it goes back to your mentors and to the people that you trust and, and that you've worked with. And this goes further back even before the start of this story and this talk to a guy by the name of Sander Connolly, who was my first neurosurgical mentor and who really got me into the field. And he, um, after Buffalo, right as I started at University of Florida and started my career, immediately reached out to me and asked me to um, get involved in an organization called the Joint Cerebrovascular Section of the AANS and CNS. Um, he did this for a myriad of reasons. One, to, to help me and advance my career. Two, because he knew that I would do the work and if he needed something done, you know, it's a mutual relationship and, and your mentors have to be able to trust in you that you're going to get things done when they ask you to. Um, but it was extremely fortuitous because I got involved in that organization in 2008 and over 10 years of being involved and climbing through that organization, I became the chair of that organization in the uh, spring of 2018. Uh, and and was the chair through the spring of 2019. And in fact, that's the reason why I was able to present in front of this panel. Uh, so think about that. It was not because I had particular expertise, but it was because I involved myself and stayed involved in the organizational leadership of our field. And in fact, the other two presenters were the president of the SVIN and the president of the SNIS. Um, I don't particularly love a lot of that organizational stuff. I love, I love the friends I've made through it. Um, but going to the meetings, being away from your family and the rest, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet, um, task. However, I, I, I bring it up to highlight to the residents why it's important because in doing this, if the people who have the expertise are not the people who are willing to step forward and serve in these kinds of capacities, then we will end up with people who just want the titles but don't have the expertise sitting in front of the FDA panels or the NIH subcommittees or the AANS executive committee uh, or the uh, American Board of Neurologic Surgery. And they will be setting our policies and our rules. 
Um, and, and we don't want that. We want the people who really care about this disease and who have that expertise uh, to be, be the people serving in those conditions. And so in a somewhat arbitrary fashion, a serendipitous fashion, I happened to be the ascending chair right when the panel was convened. And I happen to have this experience in this um, specialty and space of aneurysms. So with that, that sort of narrative and prologue, what were the specific questions that I had to answer? And I hate busy slides with lots of words, but I thought it was important to really present exactly what the FDA asked. So they said, typically an aneurysm device trial, primary safety endpoint is focused on death or major epilateral stroke defined by an eight stroke scale. Additionally, we collect safety events, AEs and, and other things. And these are the things we generally uh, consider and, and this is just a list provided by the FDA that they tend to look at. But they said, would you please tell us if this AE list is complete? If not, what should we include? But more importantly, and this is the crux of the question, are there specific rates of AEs? Should we create a threshold where we say this adverse event should raise serious concerns? Now, at first blush, when you're just thinking about this, you would say, well, of course, yeah, we, we, let's pick a thing and we say that should matter. Um, but you have to be careful because you have to get at what the definition of an adverse event is uh, to understand that. So for the first question, well, that's easy. We just gave a couple more. It's procedural thrombotic events, or delayed access site infections, cranial neuropathies after treatment of large aneurysms, things like this. But for the, quest the second question about what should, should there be specific AE numbers that we watch out? Um, about. I, I would turn to what all of you hopefully have taken as a test is the GCP uh, test to be able to do research here at Mount Sinai. You should be familiar with this. There's guidelines for good clinical practice put out by the World Health Organization. Um, and the definition is any untoward medical occurrence in someone who's in a trial. And this is important. It does not necessarily have to have a causal relationship with the treatment whatsoever. Okay. Um, so that means it can be anything. If the patient develops cancer during the follow-up period, that would potentially be an AE. More importantly, what happens in practice is that adverse event reporting is extremely variable based on the center, based on the rigor, based on the PI. Ultimately, it's the, the PI at the site. It's their call as to whether or not something's an AE or not. And so you get... A tremendous variability across the sites. Um, <clears throat> you have sites that have a really robust research infrastructure like ours, who have an outstanding team that are combing through the records of every trial patient, picking up any little thing. And, and sometimes it can be annoying, to be honest, all the research people, you guys know this, I, I think the world of you, but you get these emails saying, is this an AE, is this an AE, is this an AE? But that's important. And ultimately it's the PI's discretion. But I've been at places where, uh, and I'm sure many of our faculty have, where research is performed um, and, and there's not that kind of heavy duty screening of the chart. And a lot of things just don't raise to the level of the PI's alert. And so you, have, you run the risk of having extreme variance across centers and across trials, depending on where they're doing. And so my answer to this was no, there should not be specific rates of, of AEs. Um, one, because it does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the treatment. And, and two, as I mentioned, there's a wide variety of causes, whether it's the premorbid state, unrelated events, patient stress tolerance, patient emotional tolerance, right? Patients can, if a patient reports that they're now depressed because they had to go through this brain tumor surgery and they, they're not as, they, they have an incision on their head and the rest of that, that could be recorded as an AE depending on the PI's interpretation. Uh, but most importantly, there's extreme variability. There's no fixed denominator with objective evaluation of what could be done. Uh, and, and as an example, and this is a little bit ad, ad absurdum, but uh, this is a woman who I did a craniotomy on. I asked her permission for, to use the picture. Um, she had a mini crany. The surgery went great. And, but she, there was a little violation of the periorbit, and she had a quite swollen eye uh, post-op day one, which you can see here, which stayed swollen for a few days. Uh, in follow-up, she looks fantastic, but the reality is, is, is technically you could call this as an adverse event. Most of us wouldn't think of it, it wouldn't raise to our level, 
but this is something that, that uh, is adverse that has occurred that she didn't have. Um, if it was severe and it kept her in the hospital for an extra day, it would then qualify as a serious adverse event. So safety should be driven by a fixed endpoint and a known denominator, valid assessments, not subjective according to the PI and the robustness of the infrastructure. Uh, so this was our response to that. Then the FDA presented a second question. Uh, and they, they said the modified Rankin scale has been incorporated as a secondary endpoint in a lot of these studies. But instead, um, could the modified Rankin be the primary safety outcome? If so, uh, what numbers should we use? What's the magnitude of decline or what percentage of treated subjects with a decline should we do? Um, by the way, as I go through this, I'm hoping, particularly the residents, you're learning interesting, like you're learning things about clinical trials, what adverse events are, what are serious adverse events, and also things like the modified Rankin scale. So this is the modified Rankin scale. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a categorical scale, it's ordinal. Um, it's somewhat between, between some of the characteristics, it's somewhat subjective. Uh, and, and it has this ordinal uh, aspect to it, which is very limiting to your ability to detect differences. Would most of us consider the difference between a three and a four, which is you're able to walk and you're able to do most things, but you require some help versus you're unable to walk without assistance and you can't attend to your own bodily needs. That's a big difference. And yet mathematically, statistically in the scale, that's weighted the same as if you have no symptoms or you have a slight symptom, but it doesn't affect your life, which is the difference between a zero and a one. Uh, and so that's a real limitation. And in fact, so just so that this, you guys are all aware, this has caused the use of a different scale to come out called the utility weighted. And they, pool, they, they polled patients about how they would rank on a 10 point scale, those various states. Um, and, and therefore you get more of a weighted assessment of how much does it really mean to patients the difference between a three and a four versus a zero and a one. In the traditional scale, a zero and a one and a three and a four are both worth one point of difference, whereas with the modified scale, uh, the difference between uh, a zero and a one is 2.9, whereas the difference between a three and a four is 3.2. Um, so you get to see uh, differences. More importantly, the magnitude of that difference relative. Uh, it's an essential doubling of the points of a four where it's only a 10% increase in the points to move from a one to a 10, uh, statistically. Now that said, the utility modified Rankin is still not an accepted endpoint. The FDA still requires the use of a modified Rankin for stroke studies. And in fact, there's only been one major stroke study that I'm aware of that's used the utility weighted modified Rankin as their primary outcome. And that was the Ravascat trial. So the FDA says, hey, can we use this ordinal slightly subjective scale, modified Rankin, as the primary safety outcome, rather than being limited to death, which is very black and white, or a stroke on the side of wherever you were doing the treatment that you were doing. And so we responded to that. And, and the answer was, well, for unruptured aneurysms, that is a reasonable consideration. Um, but for ruptured aneurysms, it isn't. And we had quite a debate about this, actually. Um, because we do use it for, for stroke treatment, right? For thrombectomy, we've, we've accepted modified Reagan. So why wouldn't we accept it for acute ruptured aneurysms? And really what it came down to is when we treat a ruptured aneurysm, we're not actually providing a therapeutic uh, event. We're not actually treating something. We're performing preventative surgery. When we treat a ruptured aneurysm, we're preventing re-rupture but the natural disease course still proceeds with vasospasm, with hydrocephalus, with everything else. Um, therefore, the effect size of the treatment relative to all of the co-founders, uh, as we talked about infection, hydrocephalus, meningitis, uh, new bleeds with drain removal, vasospasm, DVTs, PEs, all of those things the signal to noise ratio does not allow adequate evaluation. For an unruptured aneurysm, yes, it's preventative, but that patient's coming in essentially intact or, or, or in some good physical condition. 
in which they could be followed. So <clears throat> for the subarachnoids, no, but for the unruptured aneurysms, the, if we think we can do that, <clears throat> their second question was, that second part of that question was, what magnitude of decline or what should we use as a threshold? And this gets into aneurysm treatment assessment. And I think this is very important for you all to know because I think it'll catch many people by surprise. But what do we have in the literature for prospective adjudicated analysis of unruptured aneurysm treatment, right? Not single series data. Um, and what's the, the morbidity using a modified Rankin as an assessment. And the Ishua study has that, okay? So there was a prospective arm of treated patients that were evaluated. And to be enrolled in Ishua, you needed a baseline modified Rankin score of zero to two, okay? So you have, by definition, no disability to get enrolled in the study. So given that, what do you think the one year modified Rankin three to six rate? Okay, now they also did, well, I'll get to that later, but the, these are everyone that enrolled was zero to two, unless there was a, a, a protocol deviation or something, one or two, I don't know. Chris knows about those. But <clears throat> if, um, if there's, if you're enrolling all your patients zero to two, you have about, I think it was like a thousand odd patients enrolled. How many, what was the percent of patients that then declined to either dead or disabled in that time period for unruptured aneurysm treatment? It was not insignificant, guys. Over six and a half percent of the endovascular treated and just over 7% of the clipped patients had a decrement to death or disability after treatment, elective treatment of unruptured intracranial aneurysms. Now, we could certainly make the argument that this, this paper came out in 2001. These patients were enrolled in the 80s and, or I think late 80s even, certainly in the 90s. Um, and certainly in the last quarter century, our, our techniques and our abilities and our imaging have progressed. But, but the reality is, is that this is what we have for independent adjudicated prospective data uh, in the published literature. Um, and so you have to keep this in mind when uh, talking to patients and addressing them. At least you can add the caveats, but they, they need to know generally uh, what's out there. Remember, these are patients that were independent to start, and yet you're looking at a six to 7% rate of disability or death at one year afterwards. Um, in case any of you don't believe me, this is the actual table. <clears throat> now, if you look at their report of death or, di or death or disability, you'll see it's a much higher number. It's 12.6% uh, for surgery and 9.8% for endovascular. Um, that's a little tricky because they did uh, complex neurocognitive status evaluation of questionable applicability. Um, and so they've added that in there. What I did, because I believe, again, that the modified ranking is a, is a co relatively concrete definition, particularly between disabled and non-disabled. Um, and so if you don't add in that middle column that says impaired cognitive status only, and you just add in modified ranking three to five, or modified ring of three to five and impaired cognitive status and death. If you add those three together, that's where you get the numbers that I just told you about. So it's pretty, pretty wild numbers. Um, and so that's what we presented to them. I sort of outlined this to the FDA and I, I explained to them why this would be problematic. Uh, from a statistical standpoint, if you're creating a threshold whereby the confidence interval can't go above it, so if you're doing a trial of, let's say 150 patients for modified Rankin scale, and your modified Rankin is, ends up being a seven, your error rate will probably be something like 1.5. Um, so you can't have seven as your threshold because otherwise you're, you would have to be down below 5% or below four and a half percent or something. Uh, and so you create a threshold that's a little higher than the target to a, a, whatever you, uh, the group agrees is uh, acceptable. Uh, so that the confidence intervals have to be below that number. I, I randomly threw out a suggestion 10%, um, but that was more for the point of discussion. Um, <clears throat> uh, next is, uh, I'm sorry guys, one second. This is regarding a patient of ours in the ICU, but I need to respond one second.
So, um, so then the next one they went to, and this was probably the most important, was uh, question number three, which was considering the adverse event list that we listed and any other adverse events you guys give, um, are there specific characteristics that should prevent, justify foregoing treatment of an aneurysm that you would otherwise consider? And this is important, right? They, they basically suggest like if the patient's a malignancy, advanced stage or aneurysm size. And this comes on the heels of uh, a large study that was submitted for uh, the flow diverter technology where, and this is really what we think pushed the convenience of this panel, um, where there was a push to exclude all patients that had aneurysms under seven millimeters treated in, in the study. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, the doctors, as a doctor, you can treat whoever you want. But the question is, is if the FDA deems that that's not a valid decision or valid patient to be treated, then you can't use that data to justify whether the technology is safe or not. And so if a study has 20% of their aneurysms that are six to seven millimeters in size, if that gets excluded, then the study will be underpowered and unable to demonstrate a benefit. I hope that makes sense. So, um, so this is, this is what this question is getting at, is are there thresholds we should apply to patients that we would include in our, in our analyses? So malignancy, I actually think that's a pretty good one. You know, one year, three years, five years. I think if you're looking at less than a five-year life expectancy, um, you know, as we, when we talk about the prospective risk of these aneurysms, according to the literature, it becomes hard to justify treatment unless a patient has a, a truly scary, devastating lesion. Um, but then what about advanced age? What do you do there? Um, you know, what if you have a patient over 80, right? Average life expectancy is something like 78, 79. Uh, if someone's over 80, does that mean like they're going to die any minute? Uh, how do you calculate what the risk is? And I'll tell you that I do this in clinic with patients often as I educate them to help them make the decision of, of what they should pursue. But let's consider this. So this is, there are updated tables, this is one I just grabbed quickly. This is from 2014, but it hasn't changed much in the last few years. This is actual US social security life expectancy data. And so if you're over 80, let's take an 81 year old person. If you're an 81 year old woman in the United States, uh, you have on average an over nine year life expectancy. Right? If you've made it that far, then there's a good chance you're going to make it to 90. Um, this is just natural data, national data that, that's out there. So what do you do if a woman who's 81 has a 8 millimeter posterior communicating artery aneurysm that carries a 14.5% risk of rupture over five years? So they've got, you know, in excess of a 20% risk of rupture. Um, we have an issuer that says that there's a 6% one-year morbidity. Um, do you accept that 6% one-year morbidity? Um, I think you need to take into account the size and shape of the aneurysm. Is it extremely wide-necked and difficult to treat and otherwise smooth and doesn't look high risk? Does it have a very small neck that could easily be coiled and have extremely low risk? Uh, nobody, I tell patients this, nobody has a crystal ball. We can't see in the future and know if you're gonna be the 6% or the 20% or any of those other things. Ultimately, we try to play the odds and use the statistics to guide us to make the best decision. Um, but I think it's absolutely worth having the conversation and considering treatment for that eight millimeter PCOM in the 81 or 82 or 83 year old person. And, and that patient deserves the conversation to discuss those pros and cons and, and make their own decision. So that's my thought on age. And that's how I go through it in clinic discussing it with patients. Um, and then that brings us to aneurysm size. And, and as I said, this had already come up on a prior FDA review of the technology. So we knew that this was going to be a real bugaboo. Should we, based on Ishua, reject aneurysms that are less than seven millimeters as a matter of course, right? And this pretty much ties to the, the table that I mentioned before. I'll say this a few more times probably, but, and I've said this to all the residents, I think it's an absolute must that every one of you have this table memorized and understand these very basic numbers. If you see, they just recapitulate themselves essentially in each category. So it's a very easy table to learn. 
But you have this data that says if an aneurysm is apparently says if an aneurysm is six millimeters and it's an MCA aneurysm or an ACOM aneurysm, well, it has a 0% risk of rupture. So it would follow that these should never be treated and that it is unethical to include these in an analysis of a technology success, right? Well, where does this come from? Uh, as I mentioned before, it comes from the study called ISHUA, the International Study of Unruptured Integrating Aneurysms. In 1998, they published a retrospective analysis, um, which is complete hogwash and really uh, is not valuable and, and shouldn't be referred to in terms of risk. But in 2001, they published in Lancet the prospective data. And, and truthfully, I think this is a, an absolute necessity in particular, this table that I mentioned to the residents, uh, that I mention the residents all the time, I think it's absolutely necessary if you're going to discuss aneurysm of natural history. Uh, if any of you decide to go into vascular and you sit for the vascular boards, <clears throat> nothing gets me more frustrated as a grader that someone says they're a vascular specialist and are sitting at the oral boards as a vascular specialist and they can't clearly delineate these risk tables. Um, and so, when this came out, it created a quite a bit of controversy, right? Because aneurysms that were less than seven millimeters potentially have a 0% risk in the anterior circulation. Um, now, I'm gonna give you some serious limitations to that issue with study. But before I do that, I'm, I want you to know I'm implicating myself. I've written papers off of this data. I discuss this data with every single patient. I think it's absolutely critical to know and understand it. But just like I insist that you should know the actual numbers, you should also read the actual papers and understand them. I have the, for the good luck to, because of serendipity, have personally read over 250 of the angiograms in this study, including every single ruptured case. So I have a level, level of detailed knowledge. It's a little beyond normal, but uh, there's a lot of this that could be gotten just by a, a detailed reading of the literature. So let's go back to this table that I've talked about that needs to be read. And let's go back particularly to this idea that all of a sudden, if you're under seven millimeters, you don't have risk of your aneurysm rupturing. Um, when this came out, it created quite a stir, right? Bryce Weir wrote this great paper published in 2002 in response to it. And what he, he reviewed 945 patients, 86% of which were ruptured that were uh, presented to his institution. Of those ruptured patients, over three quarters of them were less than a centimeter. And more importantly, over 40% of them were ACA or ACOM aneurysms, 40%. But if you looked at the issue of data, only 13% of the unruptured aneurysms were ACOMs, right? What does that mean? What I tell patients is, issue is a fantastic study. The best way to do it would have been to not treat anyone's aneurysm anywhere and then see how many ruptured, but that's not ethical. So instead what we did was we asked doctors who were gonna follow aneurysms to register them in Ishua so we could follow them. But there's an important distinction because if the doctors are good at treating, picking which ones they need to treat, which ones they don't, then this population likely underestimates the actual natural history. And nowhere is this more evident than in the presentation difference of ACOMs. Think about all of the ACOMs that we see that present ruptured. Right? It's a huge percentage, and yet it was a small percentage of that cohort. And that has to be taken into account. Right? There's a, a follow-up study, a, a different study published by Bob Carter and Chris Ogilvy um, in 2006, which also sort of highlighted that there were differences here. Right? If you looked at the unruptured aneurysms, they're all about the same size wherever the location is. But if you looked at the ruptured aneurysms, the further you went out on the vascular tree, the smaller the vessels got, the smaller the aneurysms got. So it's hard to argue that the rupture risk would potentially be equivalent between a pica aneurysm or an ACOM aneurysm and an ophthalmic artery aneurysm. There's clearly a substantial difference, at least in the way they present in terms of rupture status. And then, you know, we have new metrics. Things have evolved, right? I, I talked to you earlier, the whole reason I got involved with this was because of this size ratio term that, that we had come up with a metric. And in fact, this has been validated now in other groups the, the, in Japan, there's a thing called the Sapporo subarachnoid hemorrhage study, and they found that with the bigger aneurysms, you know, size is a rough correlate and works great, but they found that size ratio was particularly useful 
for the small aneurysms and delineating rupture status. So <clears throat> I think we've drawn an attention to the limitations of the study itself. Um, but what about just the accuracy of saying an aneurysm is six millimeters or seven millimeters? You know, what tends to happen, much like a, um, a, a biblical text or, you know, I was listening to a podcast, they were talking, these guys were talking about philosophy and philosophic texts, and they talk about how they would, they would revere these source texts and, and, and how it, was, it eventually became a detriment. When they were younger, they'd run around looking and saying, well, if, if Nietzsche said this or if Kant said this, this must be the case, instead of taking it in a broader context. And, and the reality is, is we do that in medicine, right? Something gets published in the Lima Journal or Lancet, they create us a, a nice little handy line, seven millimeters in some chart, and then people want to apply that as a blanket everywhere. But if you're going to do that, you better understand what the, the diagnostic accuracy really is of what you're doing. How did they measure five or seven millimeters in the issue of study? Well, the truth is this is before we had uh, purely digital systems, right? So a lot of the films are cut films. A lot of the films are taken on regular angiography, but did not have direct auto calibration for measurement status. And so they had to be measured back at the Mayo Clinic off of the source documents. And so one of the authors came up with, which really is ingenious, but has its own limitations, uh, an inner observer variability of angiographic measurements. They published their consistency using this new tool called the Cerebral Angiogram Magnification Minification Ruler. Um, that was invented. This is all published. I'm not, I'm not saying anything is an unknown, but if you talk to many Ishua acolytes, they won't even understand this reality. Um, and so this is the device. Uh, I have it because I've measured a lot of the angiograms for them. Um, and basically, if you're doing a lateral or an AP, you measure the biparietal distance or the front back distance of the skull based on these rulers at the top of the bottom. That gives you a magnification factor, this 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.12. And then you go to that over here and you can see there's a scaled grade of measurement. You can see five millimeters, 10 millimeters, 15, 20. And so depending on the magnification of the skull is how you get to, how you measure that distance. And they publish their inner, oh wait, well, I'll get to that in a second, but this is how, this is how they came up with it. Right, they got, this is all published if you go back to the source documents. It was done off of a retrospective skull x-ray analysis of 58 neurofibromatosis patients, skull x-rays, as well as 200 normal adults. Is that representative of, of the normal US population? I'm not sure, but if you're gonna have a seven millimeter threshold, you might wanna know that. And they published their inner observer reliability, which you can see while giving a very nice um, R squared or K, you can see that there's, there's some substantial variability with, you know, three, four millimeter variants, even in the five millimeter and six and seven millimeter thresholds, right? So how much is seven millimeters a hard white line? I, I think that it has to be taken in context. The last piece of this that completely gets ignored, and this is one of my uh, more influential early uh, essays I wrote, Dr. Solomon, when I was a resident, asked me to respond to Ishua to discuss this issue of aneurysm growth. Because, and this is a classic with, with um, aneurysmal studies like this, or, or any studies, natural history studies, is they follow patients for three years or five years, and then they say, that's your risk, and they don't account for change. And I'll go through this quickly, but basically, uh, this study shows that 3.9% of aneurysms grow per year. This study showed that just under 2% grew per year, but if they grew in the next year, they had an 18% risk of rupture. This study, which looked specifically at small aneurysms uh, of about 5.7 millimeters, they saw that they grew at about 3.5% per year. Uh, and if they looked at those just, only those aneurysms are under 7 millimeters, they still grew at 2.5% per year. If they grew, then they saw a 24-fold increase in the risk of rupture in the upcoming years. So this is important. It is not insignificant aneurysms grow and surveillance is necessary. Um, here's another large study followed about 5,000 patients for almost three years and they had about a 3% year per, per year risk of growth. So think about that. If you're dealing with a five and a half millimeter or five millimeter aneurysm 
in a, a woman who's 37 who has a 45 year life expectancy, but they're looking at a two and a half to three percent per year risk of growth. Uh, it's not insignificant. I'm not saying that you should treat that aneurysm, but the patient should be informed that that exists and that you should, you should come to a reasoned analysis of the risk benefit of treating that patient. And so in conclusion, I said to them, this was my, this was my conclusion. Aneurysm treatment's complex and nuanced, um, and it should be driven by patient choice with physician guidance and input about all of these things. And we should absolutely resist creating a well-intended uh, but completely inappropriate uh, threshold or external limit that would obviate the inclusion of patients that have six millimeter or five millimeter aneurysms in, in research studies. Um, and, and happily, uh, you, I, they listened. Um, and the panel, then they, you finish that and then it's over. <laughs> and they go into a room and they discuss for about two hours and then they come out with the recommendations. Uh, it, it's sort of like a courtroom drama. There's no further communication um, but they resisted creating AE thresholds. Um, they resisted creating uh, MRS thresholds for ruptured aneurysms. And in fact, even for unruptured, they did not specify that it was necessary. And most importantly, they acquiesced to the complexity of the decision-making for aneurysm treatment. Um, but they did say that, that in trials, there should be for these borderline aneurysms, there should be a recording of why, why one would choose to treat the aneurysm or not treat the aneurysm, which is completely justified and appropriate. And so, you know, in conclusion, and sort of the way I started this at the end was I came away feeling that I was useful. Um, this is, you know, this won't be in any objective looking at my career, probably something that's on anyone's radar but it left me feeling like I had made a substantial difference and I prevented a well-intended effort uh, from going awry and causing some real problems in our field. Um, and it came about serendipitously. It just so happened that I was ascending to the chair of the CB section. It just so happened that I had done the research to have particular insight into this issue. Um, and, and, I want the residents to know that that's one of the really cool and special things about being involved in academics, that there are targeted efforts that you make to make specific contributions, but there are also serendipitous events where you sometimes make an even bigger impact even though you didn't intend it. And I'll leave you with a quote that I like from Ralph Walter Emerson that gets to this, which is the, in, I'm sure people will have argument with this, but I, I, I find it resonates. The purpose of life is not to be happy. Maybe I'd put a qualifier there to particularly or especially, um, but it is to be useful, uh, to be honorable, to be compassionate and make sure you made a difference. You've lived well. Um, I, I think that's important. And I think that underlies the entire goal of, of pursuing an academic career. Thank you guys. Jay, that was just incredible. Just an amazing talk. And the fact that we still have 75 people on listening proves the point. Uh, so much to learn from what, what you've said. Um, so let's open it up. Chris, do you have any questions? Any comments? Um, you know, looking through that and seeing your career and trying to identify ways to emulate it, it seems like to me um, that one thing I noticed is that when you were when you were given the serendipitous opportunity, you really tackled it and and made it work, and then that increases the chance of getting more serendipitous opportunities. Is, it, is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's correct. There's a there's a saying. I don't know who it comes from. It's apocryphal, but there's a saying: um, opportunity is when chance meets preparation. Uh, and I I think that there's there's something to that. I think that. If you cultivate in yourself a, a mindset, uh, an uncompromising mindset about your willingness to do things and get things done and, and pay attention and, and, and continually try to improve yourself, then when these uh, serendipitous events occur, you're uniquely positioned to take advantage of them and, and make that impact that you would hope you would make. So yes, I think that's the case. That's awesome, thank you. 
Uh, before we open it up, I will also comment briefly just that I would translate what you've said into the concept that being busy and doing what you love to do brings you in contact with great people, interesting people. And this, the serendipitous things that have helped to propel your, your in-grown energy um, have to do with those people. You know, you mentioned Sander, Nick, and then the CB section bringing you in contact with all of the people that you now know nationally, internationally. Uh, and, and that certainly has been true in my own career. Uh, neuropolitics, as they call it, the section is, in, is really important. Uh, it was for me, it was absolutely a game changer for me. Um, and so I think in your own sections, each one of us has our own areas. It's, it is pretty important and, and puts you in contact with people who are not just important and can influence you, but they're really fun to be around and uh, they're creative. And it's what makes being in this field really wonderful. Anyone else? Looks like I got a, there's a chat thing. How do you choose that are not directly in line with what you intend to do? Uh, it's a great question. How do you not get distracted? How do you choose to pursue things that maybe weren't in your initial plan? Um, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think some of it has to be intuitive. You know, Ralph Wilder at, at Emerson was a transcendentalist who believed in sort of in, in natural intuition. It was sort of a response to the over-rationalization or empiricists of thinking. And, and there's something to that too, although I don't, I, I don't believe exactly that and what he says, but on some level, there's an intuitive component of, of engaging and feeling like you're making a difference. And, and I worry about it sometimes. There, there are projects I was, I was advising, sort of advising, talking with, you know, I, I've gotten involved with one of the pulmonologists here, Dr. Poor, on a trial of tenecteplase for COVID patients. Um, and obviously we're very quiet right now with COVID patients and, and he was expressing some frustration. And, and I, I, I literally yesterday texted him and I said, don't get pessimistic about it. This is, we're excited about it, we believe in it. And it's my experience that if you stick with it, uh, eventually it's gonna click and we're gonna get the right sites on board and it's gonna happen and we're, we're gonna get the patients enrolled. Um, <clears throat> so, so there's an intuitive component to it and there's a stick to itiveness component um, and perseverance. Um, you can't let it distract you from the things that you care the most about that you've said I have to achieve. Um, but you also can't go through life ignoring the opportunities that randomly present themselves. That would be a mistake. You know, that was, by the way, Dr. Bederson, that was Charlie Wilson's advice to me. When I, <clears throat> for the medical students that are listening, <clears throat> I used to ask, the great thing about the interview trail, and even virtually this year, is that never in your life again are you going to get a chance to sit down with all these amazing thought leaders in the space. And they all, at the end of their thing, ask you to ask them a question. And that's an <clears throat> invaluable opportunity. And so, so I would ask people, you know, what, what was important to them? How did this, how, you know, what differentiated them or allowed them to achieve the things they've done? And Charlie Wilson said to me, he had already stopped being chair. It was probably one of the last years that he interviewed. Uh, he had just given up the chair a year before. Um, he said, paying attention to the things that no one else is seeing. He said, keeping your eyes open and being able to recognize the stuff that everyone else is seeing, but they're not identifying the meaning in it. That was probably the most meaningful or differentiating part of his experience and career. Um, at least that's my paraphrase from it 25 years later, or maybe it's more than that now, I can't remember. But um, so I, I, would, I would say that's, that's the key. Jay, that was a great talk. I, I wanted to ask you one related question to Neha's, which is, you know, this, it seems like a big upshot of your talk is take the opportunities that you find in front of you because you never know where your career will lead. But I was wondering how you decide on the opportunities that are not worth pursuing, um, the ones that you think could represent dead ends. Have you ever regretted turning something down over the course of your career? 
That's a great question. Uh, some of them are very concrete that you can never know, like, should I have taken that job versus this job, right? And, and you know, if you're productive and your con career continues to go well, then you, you, and you feel more importantly, you feel internally satisfied, then obviously you made the right decision. But who knows, maybe if you'd taken the other one, even more things or different things would have happened. That's an impossible, that's, that's an impossible thought experiment. Um, but there are the more subjective and, and more fluid experiences like random things that present themselves, you know, within your job as you're moving through a given place. <clears throat> I think that there are two parts to that answer for those situations. Number one is you get better at it. So as you get older, what I often tell the residents is, when I was a medical student working on research projects, I would work on, I'd work at a 90, at a hundred percent effort level. 90% of that effort would be wasted. 10% would end up in something productive. And by the time I was a resident, when I worked at my hundred percent level, maybe 30, 40% of it would turn into productive output, but 60% of it would be wasted. Um, by the time you're a junior attending, hopefully you're 70, 30, and you know, hopefully now I'm at 90, 10 but you get better at realizing where the value is going to be and where you might be wasting your time. And you also get better at making sure the things you're doing are turning into productive output. Um, so part of that is you just got to suck it up and accept that you're going to waste some time. Like if you don't try, if you don't experience it, if you don't, you know, get in the ring and take a bunch of hits, you're never going to learn how to box. And so it's just putting your head down and plowing through it. That's part one of the answer. Part two is <clears throat> engage, but I, I tend to flow to where the opportunity becomes the most self-evident continues to go. You don't have to, this is almost counter to what I was just saying, but you don't have to continue to slog on something that isn't going anywhere. Keep it alive, continue to try to keep it, you know, cooking, but double down on the stuff where there's less headwinds and you're making lots of progress. And so in some way you respond to your environment um, and, and react to it. So that, that would be my thought. Jay, would you mind if I just added a little bit to that? And please, just, please. Uh, you said something before about stick to it uh, You do not flit. You do not flit from idea to idea. Uh, this is something I admire about you tremendously. It may mean that you end up taking on a lot of different projects, but your ability to not give up on something that you have tried or your stubbornness, whatever you want to call it, uh, it defines you. Uh, where I've seen people make mistakes is to give up on these things, even if they look unfulfilling in the moment. And I mean, I could give a hundred examples from my own career where for whatever reason I stuck to it, even if I wasn't necessarily thinking it was gonna go somewhere and it turned out to be incredibly positive. So yeah, I, I, you know, you, you have focused on taking opportunities that they, as they arise, but you are carrying behind you a long list of things that you're still working on and you don't give up on them and you keep those going to completion. So finishing these projects is something that has defined your ability to be productive. I hope you don't mind in inserting that because I don't want people to take away the message of you see something cool and then you take off on it yeah. and you go in the other direction. You're, you're right. I completely agree. You got to stick through it. And that's what I was <clears throat> trying to advise you about yesterday. <laughs> so I, I agree. It, it's, a, it's amazing how many times you feel like, oh, this is messed up or, oh, the windows passed for this or, oh, I'm not going to. I got scooped or whatever else, but then the right circumstance happened. And even though it didn't happen exactly when you thought six months later, it becomes incredibly valuable. I, I mean, uh, what, a silly example is I wrote this editorial about our experience with COVID and I wrote it in the midst of all of everything that was going on. It was an emotional piece for me. By the time it got published, right when it was about to become published, like COVID had gone away and there was nothing happening everywhere. And I felt a little, pretty darn self-conscious that I had written it. <clears throat> but by the time it actually came out, um, there were spikes everywhere else around the country and it was a very relevant thing that many people have found useful and helpful. So, so you don't, 
you, you can't overread that you really understand the way these things are going to play out and you just got to just to get it done. Well, you're a role model. Another thing that Charlie Wilson said was the best predictor of success is prior success. And the way people define success is what you've accomplished, what you've completed. Um, so, um, I, you know, you, you, you have so many admirers, Jay, and you've earned every, every single one of them. Chris, okay. anything else on this, on the, on your agenda today? Uh, that's it. That's a wrap. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone.